From the late 1940s until the digital takeover, almost all serious color photography was shot on transparency films. Whether it was the play of the game, the playmate of the year, or a moon landing, transparency film provided the sharpness and color accuracy that commercial and professional users were looking for. And every medium size or larger city had several labs that could turn around E6 processing in four hours or less. Today, unfortunately, those days are gone. So if you want the accuracy and sharpness of color transparency film, you either have to send it away and wait, or process it yourself. Today I'm going to show you the whole process of developing E6 process for slides using the new Cinestill Creative Slide 3 bath process. Now what this means is that they've actually tinkered with the original E6 formula. When the E6 was developed, the idea was that you would shoot your slide film, you'd process it, and then you put it in a projector and you would project your slides on a screen. So it was important that the slides have deep dark black tones so that your image would look snappy. And that limits the amount of shadow detail that's available. Dynamic Chrome, they claim, increases the tonal range of slide film from the traditional five stops or so to possibly as many as nine stops. I've got this uh, fancy Cinestill temperature control. And really it's a sous vide stick but they've had the firmware redone so that it is more appropriate for film processing than sous vide. In all honesty, if I were doing this over from the start, I would probably just get the cheapest sous vide stick I could find and uh, go with that. Cinestill set this uh, device up with the idea that you're going to be using it for C41 processing and that only requires two baths. E6 processing actually requires a third bath, the first developer, the reversal bath, and then the bleach and fix bath. Um, the developer essentially does the same thing that a black and white developer does. It uh, develops an initial negative image. The reversal bath chemically fogs the undeveloped areas of the image so that they're in reverse proportion to the original exposure and then the uh, bleach fix bleaches out the original exposure leaving the reverse part behind. Cine still wants you to run this process at 104 degrees so the first step for me to do is start up my sous vide stick and I'm going to let it run a few minutes until uh, its indicated temperature reaches 104 degrees. You'll notice that I am wearing gloves and you can't see it but I'm also wearing goggles and an apron because E6 chemicals are quite a bit nastier than the uh, chemicals used for black and white processing. So I want to be a little extra careful with these. I'm going to take five ounces of my tempered distilled water. To that I will add five ounces of my first developer. Now I'm going to use my homemade Robobox attachment. I'll put that on. I'll start it up. You can see it's turning away. Now pour my pre-soaked water into the tank. And then I will just plop the lab box right into the water bath. This is a little tricky. You've got to make sure that your water bath that is at a level where it won't come in over the top of the lab box. And I'm going to give that one minute to pre-soak my film. My pre-soak has been going on for the desired amount of time. So I'll just pull the lab box out. I'm dumping the pre-soak water out in the sink. It has this odd green color. Now I will put the first developer in and I'll plop the lab box back in the water bath. You'll notice that bubbles are escaping around the knob because the outer track of the knob is connected to the airspace underneath the lab box. Now that it's in there, I'm going to start my first timer and now we're timing for nine minutes. But we just got to the end of the developing interval so I'm going to pour the developer out. Now one of the things I discovered the hard way the first time I tried this process is that the developer will stain porcelain sinks purple. So I'm pouring it into a sink that already has some water in it. Now you're supposed to rinse the film either for 60 seconds in running water or six changes of still water. So while we're rinsing our 
film, I'll pour out the reversal bath. Unlike the first developer, the reversal bath and the bleach fix can be reused several times. So we'll make it a point to save this after we pour it out. So that's going to need to go for at least six minutes. So now I'll pour my bleach pets in. Okay, we're back and we're close to the end of our bleach fix cycle. As you can see, I've turned off the uh, circulator because we don't really need that at this stage. I could have actually turned it off at the beginning of this step. Uh, and I've also taken out the bottles because uh, they're not uh, needed for temperature control anymore. As soon as this is done, I will uh, pour the bleach fix out. Uh, there we are now. So I will pour this into a container so we can save it for later. I'll just set that aside until we pour it back into the bottle. And I will turn off my Robo Box attachment and set that aside because now we're ready to move this over into the wash. It's actually safe to remove the lid any time up to the uh, bleach fix cycle. I'm going to remove this because I actually have about uh, 20 exposures left on this roll of film. So as soon as this little end dries out, I can trim a liter in that and that will be ready to go back into the camera. And when I'm getting ready to wash, I like to wash right in the lab box, but I also like to take the film chamber off first because I don't want to get water down here and get the cutter blade rusty and so on. So I'll remove that, wipe it off, set it aside. And now I'm just going to set this under running water. I'll take the film guide out because we don't need that anymore. I'm going to dump the film guide into this so that it can soak. I'll put a little water in the inside of the lid so it can soak. Now we're almost to the end of our six minute wash period and there's just one final step of treating the film for drying. Now in the old days, in the 70's when I was developing uh, E6 film in my college darkroom, you had to finish by soaking the film in a stabilizer which contained formaldehyde which is really bad for you and also made your darkroom smell like a biology lab. Now that's no longer necessary because the stabilizers are incorporated into the film emulsion and they're activated by the action of the bleach fix. All we really need to do, just as you probably do with your black and white film, is add a little wetting agent so that you'll get spot free drying like this. So, since you use Photofluid 200 at a 200 to 1 dilution ratio, all I've got to do is squeeze the bulb, draw up two and a half milliliters, put that in the tank, turn my agitating knob for about 30 seconds. Okay, that's 30 seconds according to the timer on the wall, so I will dump that out. Now I can pull the film reel out of the lab box. I'll put this back in because we're going to let it soak to get photo flow residue out of it. In the meantime, I'll just take a peek at the film. Now I'll warn you, this throws a lot of people the first time they do E6 film. When the film is wet, it looks very bluish. That's not necessarily anything bad, it's just the way that it works. All I'm going to do is see if it's got anything that looks like images on it. Okay, those look like images. They're a little dim, but I'm going to assume they're okay. After the film was dry, I started out by just holding it up to the light and I was worried. It seemed unusually flat and dark. But when I put it on a light box and compared it to some lab processed E6 film, I realized there wasn't that much overall difference. So 
so you dilute your first developer one to one. That means you start out with two liters of first developer, you're using 300 milliliters a time. That means you're going to get through basically six rolls of film before you run out of first developer. Another thing you have to keep in mind in terms of capacities is that the first developer only lasts two to six weeks once it's mixed. So you either want to accumulate a batch of films before you mix it and start processing, or you want to have a project in mind where you're going to go through six rolls so that you're using up the full capacity of the kit. Shooting this way is not tremendously expensive, but it isn't horrendously cheap either. Prepaid processing mailers for Fuji from B&H Photo, for example, you're going to be paying $12.99 a roll for processing. Cinestill prices the one liter kit at $39 currently, but I figure that by the time you've paid shipping and so forth, you'll have spent about $48, and so for your six rolls of film, you'll be paying about $8 a roll in chemistry. Yes, that's better than $12.99. Yes, you do get it more quickly, but it is something to keep in mind. This is not the least expensive way to do film photography. But how good are the results? Well, let's take a look at the chromes, as we used to say back in the old days. Let's take a look at this image, because it's one of my less weird, moody images, and talk about some of the details. The colors are natural but vivid. And if you look up here at the top of the sign, you can see that the black area of the sign is a good, solid black. But if you look over here at the eaves of the house, you're seeing quite a bit of detail in the shadows, a good deal more detail than I would normally have expected to see in traditional E6 slides. The uh, overall appearance of the image is, um, other than the fact that I didn't focus it very well, is really pretty terrific. Grain is very fine, uh, the details are sharp, colors are smooth. Now you know why people back in the day loved to use chrome films. They really provide a very high quality image even by today's standards. One of the things that Cinestill says about this product is that when you use it at the normal one-to-one -one dilution, it has a warmish tone and gives what they call a cinematic look. I'm not sure what they mean by cinematic, but I do like the look I'm getting the slides. In terms of the warm tone, I'd say I mostly see it in greens and browns and more in the darker areas. If you've got an underexposed image, you'll definitely see more of a warm look throughout. But if you make a more conventional exposure, you'll see the warmth only probably in the shadow areas and as I say particularly in the greens and browns. It's kind of like you shot everything about half an hour before sunset. In terms of the claim about extended tonal range, I'd say it holds up pretty well. This building is actually clad with matte metal so it reflects light. If you look at the brightest highlights up here, you can see that except right in the specular highlight areas, you're still seeing a good gradation of highlight detail all through both facets. As you get farther down, you notice that again the warmth of the image picks up a little bit and you see good gradation all throughout the lit area of both panels. And yet at the same time, when you look over here to the dark part of the building, the part that's actually in the shadow, if you look closely enough you can see there is actually some detail visible back here in the roof and there's quite a bit of detail visible down here in the windows on the side away from the sun. In a perfect world, I would shoot another roll of exactly the same subject and send it off to a lab for E6 processing. I haven't had the opportunity to do that, but I'd say I am getting a longer tonal range than I normally would have expected to get, and that's great. Cinestill says that Dynamic Chrome is optimized for scanning, and the images do scan very easily. They produce a wide range of tones, and they produce a good look. Now here's something I think is funny. If you're the sort of film photographer whose idea of what the film look is is based on faded snapshots, you may not like the look of dynamic chrome at all or using transparency film at all. You may be stuck in the idea that film is supposed to have everything either kind of turquoise or kind of pink, have very pastel colors, have very low contrast. That's not what you get shooting with chrome film. It's very commercial, it's very crisp, it gives you lucid, accurate renderings of what your subjects look like. You may feel that it looks too much like a digital camera, and that's not a surprise because when digital cameras were new, this was the look they were striving for. Shooting chrome films is definitely a bigger investment both in money and in time than shooting color neg films or black and white neg films. If you do like this look, and if you're digitizing your film images for digital publication, Dynamic Chrome is definitely worth a look. It gives a very scanner-friendly image with a good tonal range, and it still provides that crisp, clean, transparency look that all of us love from the 70s.